Do genetic mutations produce the kind of change required for the evolution of life? Stay tuned for some cutting-edge research on Creation Magazine Live. Okay, evolutionists claim that mutation is the mechanism that drives evolution forward. It's what creates all the new things so that we could have gone from a microbe to, to man and That's everything right. in between. So what is a genetic mutation? Well, <laughs> DNA has four chemical letters. You spell out those four chemical letters in a certain sequence. They code for the genetic information, for the structures, fe features, and functions of whatever uh, creature you're talking about. So mutations are primarily copying errors. When DNA is making a copy of itself, sometimes you can get copying errors, mistakes. Um, you can also get um, mutations due to radiation, things like that. But primarily, right. they're when uh, DNA is making copies of itself. Right. So. Yeah. Basically, if you're looking at evolution theory and trying to think, okay, well, how does it happen? Here, here's here's the, the the way it happens, right? Kind of a formula for evolution, right? You've got uh, you've got a code that you're you're mutating. So you, mutations plus natural selection. So natural selection is going to weed out the best of those new mutations. That's the, the new way the story goes. Yeah. That's going to equal evolution from one kind into another. So if you've got something like a lizard, you can turn it into a bird over millions of years by these new mutations that add new functions and features and it develops feathers and all this kind of stuff. So mutations provide new features and functions and natural selection eliminates the less fit. Um, evolution isn't just genetic recombination. It's not like if you take a uh, you know, a, a Great Dane and a, and a poodle and somehow get them to mate and, and, and recombining genetic information that's there. Right. It's new stuff. You, you need a process that generates new genetic information. Yeah, we want to properly define our terms. Right. And when we're talking about mutation, we're just talking in a general sense about changes to the, the instruction, changes to the genetic code. Right. The instructions for how to build a living thing. Now, there are, and at that level, Mutations plus natural selection equals evolution. It sounds great. Right. If it sounds very reasonable. If mutations are actually capable of creating new functions and features, then that, that would work, right? Yeah, it provides yeah. a range of different organisms from which natural selection then chooses the most fit to survive. Right. It all makes sense. Yep. So let's, let's look at some, there are different types of mutations. If we have a look at different types of mutations here. Uh, there's the substitution, and that's probably the, uh, uh, the, the, the most basic type. Uh, one of the most basic types. Here's our genetic code, CTG, GAG, and if we have a substitution, all right, the A is turned into a G. So you substituted one letter for another. Yes, there's an yeah. example of a substitution. Here's an insertion. Start again with that same code, and here we have, okay, three letters have been inserted. That's an insertion. That's another type of right. mutation. Here's another one, deletion. That one, you probably already know it, where that's going to go. If that one and that one are deleted, we're left with that. And here's another one, frame shift. This one's kind of interesting. If our, if our DNA codes for something like this, the dog <laughs> bit the cat, and we blow away the first letter, and everything shifts, it's a yep. frame shift, we're left with that. And that doesn't mean anything in English anymore. And there's other types of mutations as well, inversions, duplications, translocations, right. that type of thing. So and this is just analogous to, the, to really to what we really see. These are the types of mutations that are occurring yes. in living things, right? So really, when, when you look at it, well, mutations do alter the genetic code. They do. We, right? can, we can freely admit that. So they it, alter the genetic code. So you've got to watch out for the, your definitions, because if you say, well, mutations are just change in the genetic code, or they're changes in living things, well, then that would mean, if that's what evolution is, then evolution's occurring. But yes. we don't think evolution's occurring. <clears throat> we, and we certainly believe that things change over time, yes. and that things change from generation to generation, right. and that the genes are changing, and in some cases via mutation, right. that, uh, that those things are changing uh, because of mutation. So people are going to ask then, if we believe all that, of course that's what evolutionists believe yeah. as well, how can we be coming to two different conclusions if, if, if we both believe the same things? Well, it's because uh, they, they might alter the genetic code, but do they alter it in a way that will lead to the evolution of a more complex life form from a simpler one? That's the real question, isn't it? If we're just seeing changes that can make things simpler or degenerate, 
that's not what evolution needs to show. Because if you at one time had a microbe that turned into something like a horse, let's say, over millions of years, what would you have to do to the genetic code of a bacteria to turn it into a horse? You'd have to write in all this brand new information. These mutations would be having to code for genetic information like, like hearts and lungs and eyes and exactly. blood and muscles and bones yeah. because bacteria don't have that. Horses do. So we're going to look at whether these mutations can actually do that. Can they provide new information for new structures, functions, and features? Over three chapters, the book of Genesis vividly describes a worldwide flood that began with all the fountains of the great deep bursting forth and the floodgates of heaven being opened. The reality of Noah's flood is the crux of the conflict between evolutionary and biblical worldviews. If this global deluge really happened, then the millions of years of earth history and evolutionary progression supposedly seen in the fossil record are swept away. The flood accounts for the major geological features and the vast majority of the fossil record. Indeed, the fossils themselves are a mute testimony to the truth of the flood. We find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Just what you would expect from the biblical account. If Christians were to believe and effectively defend the biblical account of the flood, then the basis for the evolutionary worldview would largely collapse. Many people would be saved from such a great pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Okay, if mutations, are, they're the deal, that's what's driving evolution forward. What are mutations actually doing? Mutations accumulate in each individual from conception. So... Um, Actually, what mutations do is they kill you. They, they, to, put it, to put it very succinctly, that's exactly what they do. Yeah, you want to know, why you, yeah, right. you, want to know yep. why you get old? You want to know why your skin doesn't you know, look, look as nice as you? You get wrinkles, you, you, you degenerate because you're mutating. That's right. Each one of your cells, it, you know, it gets copied and copied and copied. Every seven years, you're a new person. They say, they say that uh, virtually every cell in the body is regenerated uh, after seven years. So uh, if you think yes. you were somewhere 14 years ago, you weren't. <laughs> it was somebody else. It was a whole different group of cells that were there. Let's look at some of the numbers here. We can look at uh, uh, genetic decay in individuals. In every person, every time your cells divide, there's two to three mutations per cell division, right. which is... Phenomenal. It's just incredible. It affects every cell in your body, some more than others. Right. Why? Because some cells reproduce quicker or more often than others. The average cell, get this, the average cell in a 15-year-old has 6,000 mutations. So if you're out there and you're watching the program and you're, you're around 15, the average cell has 6,000 mutations. It gets worse. A skin cell in a 60-year-old has up to 40,000 mutations. Right. Is there any wonder why your skin gets wrinkly yep. after a while? Mutations are the primary cause of aging and death. Right. So if you don't get shot, you don't get hit by a bus, you know, you don't have some... Some violent end to your life. Yeah. Sooner um, or later, your body degenerates and you die because of mutations, individually. Yes. yes. That, is, that is sort of like cutting-edge science in genetics. All of this is fairly uh, recently discovered in genetics. Right. Um, we talked with uh, Dr. John Sanford, who's a geneticist. His, his specialty was, was plant genetics. Uh, he wrote a book called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Human Genome. He studied human population genetics, exactly this topic that we're doing this week on Creation Magazine the Live. Inventor of the gene gun? Inventor of the gene gun, yes. Fairly famous in the genetics yes. community. Here's what he said about how fast mutations are accumulating in the human genome. In fact, one of the early, uh, most famous uh, population geneticists, Mueller, said if the mutation rate goes above one, every species will go extinct. And, and the fact that it's near 100 is very disturbing from that point of view. In fact, it kind of blows your mind. And uh, 100 doesn't include uh, uh, many uh, classes of mutations. For example, that wouldn't include mutations in uh, what's called satellite DNA. It doesn't consider the fact that some mutations, like insertions and deletions, affect dozens or hundreds or thousands of nucleotides in a single mutation. So the number of letters in your genome uh, that are different from your parent through th this typographical error process is uh, probably thousands of, of nucleotide changes per generation, most of which are deleterious. Incredible. I mean, we, we, we talked about mutations building up from the point of conception, right. and now we're changing gears and talking about some of those mutations are passed on to the next generation. So Dr. Sanford here, someone who's very knowledgeable about, about this topic, yes. there's hundreds 
of mutations, but it's, it, it gets worse than that, actually. If we were to add up all of the different types of mutations uh, in the human genome, it would look something like this. In the mitochondrial DNA, it's, it's quite stable. There's less than one mutation, one new mutation per generation. In uh, the nucleotide substitutions, those point mutations that we talked about earlier, uh, 100 to 300 mutations there, satellite mutations, another 100 to 300. Deletions account, you can see the numbers there, 300 to 3,000. Another that many duplications and insertions. Thousands, somewhere in the thousands area for inversions, translocations, and again, thousands of conversions. All of that adds up to thousands of mutations per person per generation. Right. So what are the implications for evolution? On an, in an individual basis, mutations are what cause you to die. So you, you accumulate these mutations over time, but then some of those mutations, you pass those on to your kids, and those are accumulating in the next generation. So in effect, that next generation starts with more mutations than the former generation yes. did. So there's two, two effects we're, we're, we're showing here. The viewers here are starting to maybe get a little bit alarmed at, at where this is heading, where we're heading with this. Right. If mutations continue to build up and destroy information, destroy functions and features in the human genome, what does that mean for evolution? Creation.com is the world's most powerful internet resource for finding answers to questions about the origins debate. It includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs and related materials. Scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 8,000 articles, many of which have appeared in leading creationist publications over more than 30 years. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creation.com. Okay, we're looking at mutations, the so-called mechanism for evolution, and uh, what they're actually, uh, what we're seeing in science, what they actually accomplish. And, you know, what we've been talking about here is, is this just news for creationists? I mean, the Bible clearly states that God created everything very good. And since the sin and, and, and death, since the fall uh, of, of man happened, um, basically, there's been a degeneration over years. That's what creationists would teach. And so some people say, well, yeah, but you guys are just massaging the data here to fit your, your story, so to speak. But actually, what we're saying is, no, the science supports what the scripture actually says and describes, and et cetera, et cetera. Yes, and it's not just a creationist idea. Leading human population geneticists have said the same thing. Right. Here's some quotes here. Leading geneticists like Dr. Kondrashov. No human geneticist doubts that man is degenerating. Dr. Lynch, even assuming a lower mutation rate, we are degenerating 1 to 5 percent per generation up to 10 percent. Now he's talking That's, fitness level. He's, he's talking, yes, our, our ability to live and survive as a fitness level. We'll, we'll talk about that in a, right. in a few minutes. Uh, there's, there's another amazing quote by Dr. Crow where he says, we're inferior to cavemen. Oh, wait a sec. I mean, when I was in school getting taught about evolution, the cavemen, they were inferior to us. They're right. going, ugh, ugh, and they're not too bright, and da-da-da-da-da. And, and, and the guy who's saying this is an evolutionist, right? So that, right. that's his view, likely, of cavemen as well. So he was saying, genetically, they're, they were superior to us. Yes. Well, that runs totally counter, counter uh, to what the evolutionary story I was taught. Yeah, we're says. degenerating at a phenomenal rate. Right. Uh, we have over today over 6,000 inherited Mendelian diseases. There's 2 to 3% birth defects in babies born today, and right. it's just getting worse. Right. Now, in order for evolution to work at all, they need to have some way of, of slowing down or stopping this, this decay of the genome. In, in fact, it's supposed to go the other way. It's supposed to be slowly be built up over time. And they must be saying that, well, it must have been different in the past, because you couldn't have had this accumulating for, for you know, three million years if you were degenerating at this rate. We wouldn't be right. here by now. Yes. Right? Right. Here's what Dr. John Sanford said about that. All human geneticists acknowledge that we are degenerating at present. And some of them think that we're degenerating very rapidly. Um, and so, uh, you know, because they're mostly evolutionists, they would say, well, in some time in the distant past, selection was stronger, and that would be able to stop the mutation accumulation. But of course, uh, if the mutation rate is too high, there's no amount of selection that can stop the accumulation of mutations. And that's everything, all of my analysis and the analysis I've done with colleagues indicate that uh, there's no amount of selection. So at no t time in history what, uh, was selection ever strong enough to stop the continuous accumulation of mutations. 
Okay, well, so the answer is a clear no. The, the way that we often think about mutations is, is a little bit off from what science has discovered. We, we kind of think of mutations this way. If you think of you're driving along and you get a dent in your car, right, Some, something like this, um, and, it, and it's thought that, well, if you have a, a dent in your, if a mutation is like a dent in a car, you just go and you get your car Natural repaired. Natural selection is going to select that out. If there's an obvious corruption, the creature doesn't live long enough to pass on its genes, it's eliminated from the gene pool, selection has taken place, it's yes, okay. Yes, yes. But it's more accurate to think of these, of, think of these mutations as rust on every part <laughs> of your car. Most mutations are neutral. And, and natural selection, it, it can't see them. It, it's it not operate, able to see those things. Right? Um, it, there's, what has been the response to this research that Dr. Sanford has done from the evolutionary community about these massive mutations? Listen to this. But one thing that's encouraging for me is uh, really they have not, I, I thought when I published this book um, that uh, I thought, man, they're, they really know their stuff and I'm kind of an outsider for the population of genetics niche and so uh, they're probably just going to tear me to pieces and what I found was uh, they don't have any counter arguments they basically have nothing to say it's been six years now and I haven't heard any reasonable arguments from anyone in the field so I I'm increasingly it's increase, increasingly clear that um, that the problem is real and that it's been kind of swept under the rug but they do not have reasonable answers that could, uh, or reasonable evolutionary mechanisms that could stop the degeneration. A question people often ask is, does the Bible mention dinosaurs? You might expect that the Bible would mention the most impressive land-dwelling beasts of God's creation, since he created them on day six along with people. Indeed, in Job chapter 40, God directs Job to consider the crowning glory of his creation, behemoth, as testimony to his creative power. Behemoth is described as a colossal beast, feeding on grass like an ox and living in marshes, with great strength in its loins and power in the muscles of its belly. Its bones are like tubes of bronze, and it has a tail that sways like a cedar. Certainly not a hippopotamus or an elephant, which have tails like a small piece of rope. The description in Job is consistent with the huge sauropod dinosaurs found in the fossil record, such as Apatosaurus or Brachiosaurus, which now appear to be extinct, but were still alive at the time of Job. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, so mutations are accumulating in the human genome at a phenomenal rate, far higher than evolution is able to account for, and natural selection is unable to weed them out. There's a program on the internet that, the internet that you can download called Mendel's Accountant. You go to mendelsaccountant.info, and there are some instructions there on what the program is all about. It's a program that can be used to accurately simulate genetic mutations. And right. you can put in, you can see here on the screen, all kinds of different variables you can put in, your population size. You can even select the number of favorable mutations, information gaining mutations, those, those types of things. Right. Um, and, and play with all those values and try to get a population to live. <laughs> I guess that's the challenge. So it's not but even a, can they evolve? It's, it's whether they can survive or not over it's, a long it, period of time. How can, is there any scenario of, of mutations creeping in that would enable a population to, to, to live. Right. Um, here are one of the outputs from, the, uh, from this program here. And again, you can download it, go to mendelsaccountant.info, and you can play with this program yourself. Look at that red line. That red line is a fitness level. That's the, the, at 100% fitness up there at the top. That's your ability to live and survive. Look at it drop. Now, what, what are the parameters that are put in well, you there? Can is, see are they realistic? In the middle of the screen there, they're, they're actually highly favorable. Uh, the mutation rate of only 100, where it's actually in the thousands, and the fraction of favorable mutations is quite high. Uh, most geneticists, evolutionary geneticists, uh, suggest a million to one. A good million, mutations to bad to, mutations. <laughs> good to bad, yeah. And, and what do we got here? We're dealing with what? That's about 200 generations, and you can see it uh, decaying there. Uh, when that red line gets to zero, you have extinction. It, it, in reality, it never really gets to zero because you don't have enough people left in the population to keep it going, right. and then you have an extinction event. Right. But, uh, well, that's an interesting graph, though, because I'm, I'm noticing this curve looks something very similar to what I've seen before, and that's uh, any, anybody that's uh, read the scripture and studied the lifespans of the patriarchs, for example, 
uh, yes, in, that's the, right. in the Old Testament from Adam uh, moving forward to, to the time of the flood, there's an interesting um, uh, correlation here. Uh, look at that. So declining lifespans. This is, this is after the flood? I mean, that, that white, bleeding up from, from, Noah, from Noah onward. Okay. Uh, that white line looks a lot like the red line right. uh, in the previous picture. I mean, that, that other one there, there's the evolutionary prediction. Going right. from, uh, from zero to 100%, or, or just remaining at 100%, I suppose you could predict that as well. But there's the scientific reality. It doesn't fit the, fit the story of evolution at all, right. and yet it fits the Bible. Okay, so if we're all heading to death as a, as a human species, individually and as a human species here, uh, that, that's pretty depressing. I remember reading John's, Dr. Sanford's book and yes. being, oh my goodness, but I remembered something. Um, if you really understand reality, it, it doesn't have to be depressing. So let's listen to Dr. John Sanford uh, one more time and, and see what he says about this. People would ask me, well, that, you know, why are you studying this? It's so grim. And um, how can you stand thinking about it? And for me, it's really important to deal with reality. Uh, but really, even as a population, this whole circle of life and everything just keeps going is a, is a, is a delusion. And so, so it's really important we deal with the reality that, uh, that life, that we live in a perishing world. It's just really important to confront that reality. And then people can start li making appropriate decisions of what their priorities should be and where they should put their hope. Now, as I study human genetic degeneration, you might think I get really discouraged. I am full of hope. My hope is in Christ. My hope is in heaven. Christ promises if we are in him, if we are right with him, that, um, that we will live with him forever in imperishable, incorruptible bodies. That's where my hope lies, and I would encourage all people to put their hope there. That's amazing. Dr. Sanford is a former evolutionist, former atheist. He right. said evolution was his religion. That's what he said. And now he's changed positions, and death, for, we're all heading for death. It's, if you're not a Christian, that is scary. Right. I mean, it, 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 that, that's a scary proposition. But um, it, we, we can look at verses like in 1 Corinthians 15. For, for the Christian, death does not win. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where is your sting, Paul writes. For the Christian, there is an escape from death. We'll all die. That's what genetics is telling us. But for the Christian, uh, we encourage everyone to consider Christianity and, and, and escape the, the bleakness of death. For a more in-depth understanding of topics relating to the creation-evolution debate, the Journal of Creation contains peer-reviewed research papers that support the biblical account of creation, the flood, and the fall. One subscriber said, I always assumed that this journal would be too academic for me. Not so. I am a Christian with a very inquiring mind. With each issue, I find powerful articles that open doors and shine light on my understanding of the world. Each journal of creation is more than 120 pages and published three times a year. To subscribe, visit creation.com. Welcome to the feedback section of Creation Magazine Live. Uh, Creation Ministries produced a pamphlet uh, called 15 Questions for Evolutionists. And they're just, uh, just straight up what it says. There's 15 questions that are very difficult for an evolutionist to explain. That's why we, we produced it. We encourage people to uh, you know, spread that around. You can also get a copy uh, electronically off our website. Now, of course, we got feedback from uh, from many evolutionists, kind of right. made a bit of a stir in the evolutionary community. It attempted answers to these 15 questions. Exactly, and uh, they're not doing that well, uh, answering them. As a matter of fact, we're doing a video series on our uh, other program called Genesis Unleashed, and you can watch those videos. You can go to creation.com, go to the Media Center, and uh, look, at, look at some different uh, right. episodes there. And we're putting video responses out. So we're, we're explaining what the questions are, and we're also giving evolutionists a chance to respond and then responding to their responses, so to speak. Anyway, one of the responses that we got back was this, uh, regarding natural selection, actually. But the fellow said, well, there's over 100 new mutations for every child born. It's inevitable that evolution would happen with this rate of mutation. Those with the best mutations survive and reproduce. I, I remember the first time that I, that I saw that, and I was just blown away by, by, by this guy's comment. It, it kind of brings to mind, a little knowledge is dangerous. <laughs> But I was thinking to myself, this, he, here's someone, and I think this is a popular idea. Here's someone who has a comic book understanding of what mutations actually do. Right. When I, when I was a kid, I used to I'd read comics all the time, you know. 
didn't go to church, I'd get a buck, go down to the corner <laughs> store, I'd get two Marvel comics, a Coke and a bag of chips for a buck. And, and, and I mean, in, in the comics, it was great. You get a mutation, you get a superpower, right? Yes. When you think about yep. it, most people are taught in school that evolution's basically a fact, that mutations are the mechanism to do it. So they're thinking, well, the more mutations you have, the better you'd be. Because, I mean, in a sense, they're correct. I mean, if you need these mutations to cause evolution, then the more mutations you get, the better it is. But we just looked yeah, at it. Yeah. Are more mutations better? Do you really want some mutations? <laughs> no. I mean, and, and, and pe people do know this in society. I mean, in, in the 80s when Chernobyl blew up over there right. in, in, in Russia, you didn't see people, you know, well, let's make some campgrounds and trailer parks and come and live here and, and right. get more mutations. Evolutionists weren't saying, hey, well, let's go live over there because it's a good thing. No, mutations are a bad thing. Thing. Yes, uh, that's yeah. what that was we're seeing. So you know, I remember Stan Lee, the creator of some of the the biggest comic book heroes, you know, Spider Man, the X Men, and all this stuff. And I remember seeing an interview with him one time, and he said, "Well, you know, when he came up with the idea of the X Men, he didn't. Well, how did they get their powers? That's always the big deal, right?" And he said, "Well, I just call them mutants. They're, they're just mutants, and so that, that's how they got their powers. And that's basically all he thought about it. That he didn't go into it deeper. It was it was only later on that many of the writers kind of co opted this idea of." evolution, you know, and mutations being part of evolution, and that yeah, these were now, yeah. you know, children of the atom, that they were mutants uh, they were evolving into the next stage. Yes, and, and yes, and like there's that. the comic book understanding of, of what mutations do. You get a mutation, you have a superpower all right. you can You have lasers coming out of your eyes, or you, can, you have, you know, you can regrow your, your, your wounds and, and, yeah, and yeah. That, whatever. It, it's at the beginning of the first X-Men movie yeah. uh, years ago there. I remember uh, uh, Captain Picard, the narration on a black screen was there, and he was saying, mutation, the key to our evolution. Right. Well, that's and what evolutionists believe. It, yes. But boy, if you're getting 100 new mutations every, every generation, you're not going to evolve. You're going to die at a rapid rate. You're, gonna, no. you're headed for extinction. <clears throat> so. Ev evolutionists really, in, in order, this, this whole notion of, of, if I was an evolutionist, I'd be looking for some way to get rid of the whole mutations Thing because it doesn't help evolution. The argument's not working. You, mutations destroy and delete functionality. The the, the specified complexity in, in the, the the instructions, the blueprint that's there yeah. for how to run a living thing, is being destroyed that's by right. mutations. And yet there has to be some mechanism without God, without intelligence, to generate new genetic instructions to build all these bigger and better living things over millions of years. Yep. Yeah. I mean, when you really think about it, evolution makes it makes great science fiction. You it, really, it you know, does. You know what it I mean? Does. You read a fantasy story because, in effect, it's like magic, right? I mean, you're a little kid, you're reading a fairy tale. Look, you may wave your magic wand, boom, something's there that wasn't there before. Well, it's kind of like evolution. You, you wave the magic evolution wand, and all of a sudden, new things happen and new creatures. Yeah. And all that. Star Wars, and you get all these new creatures via mutation. But it's not science; it's science fiction. <laughs>